Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. This is episode 84. This is for the week of November 29th to December 5th, 2012. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour or so, I'm going to be ranting at you and telling you things. Uh, things are important to me, and I think deserve to be important to you as well. Uh, comments, questions, whatever, can be sent to me directly at whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. If you didn't catch that, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up, uh, up a couple times around here during the course of the show. You can get the email address from there. Uh, as always, if uh, you do send me email, please include something uh, like your left side of the aisle or whatnot in the subject line so that I know it's not spam. All right, with those necessary introductions out of the way, I'm going to get right to it. I just got a couple of things I have time for today. Uh, first off, I'm going to go right off to our uh, regular weekly feature, the Outrage of the Week. Now, um, unfortunately, this week, I'm not going to be able to get into that long discussion about the so-called grand bargain to avoid the fiscal cliff that I promised, but this is going to be debated in Congress for at least a couple more weeks, so I, I still got time. The point uh, I will simply say here is to repeat what I said last week. Uh, it ain't grand, it ain't no bargain, and there ain't no cliff. So, on the other hand, this week's Outrage of the Week will give you some sense of some of the nonsense that's being cooked up about this. Last week, when CBS Evening News wanted to ask someone about what to do about this so-called fiscal cliff, who did they pick? Why, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, of course. Who else would they ask? His, uh, his name is Lloyd Blankfein, and in case you can't tell, he's the one on your right. Now, they may have picked Blankfein uh, to interview because he's been pushed out there as a point man by this outfit called the Campaign to Fix the Debt. This is basically a bunch of corporate CEOs who have made trillions of dollars in federal war contracts, subsidies, bailouts, along with specialized tax loopholes and breaks that have virtually eliminated their company's tax bills and who themselves are paid tens, tens to hundreds of millions of dollars a year, but who now are going to go out there and tell the rest of us what we have to give up. And the thing is, I didn't have to tell you what that is. You know what they're saying. Uh, cut, that means slash, programs that are of benefit to you while maintaining or even expanding the ones that are of benefit to them. The big three, uh, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, oh, they're on the chopping block. Uh, along with assorted low-priority spending. Now, they don't define what, lo what constitutes low-priority spending. But uh, last spring, the, uh, the House Goppers showed what they thought of as low-priority spending when they passed the so-called Ryan budget. Uh, it included, among other things, cut food stamps, cut school lunch programs, cut employment and training programs, cut the child tax credit, and eliminate the social services uh, block grant, which provides services to 11 million needy children, as well as supporting Meals on Wheels programs and community-based health care for the elderly. That's what they regard as low priority. Now, on CBS, Blankfein said that what we have to do, we have to do, and I'm quoting him here, is lower people's expectations. The entitlements and what people think they're going to get, they're not going to get it. In other words, he's saying the message should be, you're going to be poor, get over it. I mean, Social Security, what does he want to do with that? He said, raise the retirement age, cut benefits, and cut the cost of living allowances. We have to do this, he said, because after all, he said, again quoting him, Social Security wasn't devised to be a system that supported you for a 30-year retirement after a 25-year career. Excuse me, but what? Maybe I should have made this the clown award instead of the outrage. I mean, yeah, 25-year career? Yeah, maybe if you started working at 42. 30-year retirement? Sure, if the average person lives to be 97. And at the same time they're spewing this kind of bilge, the same group is pushing for what they call a territorial tax system. As under this, the, the profits their companies make in foreign countries would be exempt from taxation. That would cut their tax bills by about $134 billion a year. Another of these bozos in this group, the CEO of Honeywell, his name is David Cote, uh, 
is saying that corporate tax rate should be as low as possible. In fact, it should be zero. And by the way, don't expect them to be lowering their own expectations or, or to forego federal money or pay or higher taxes on their own personal income. No, instead what they argue for is, quoting them again, comprehensive tax reform which broadens the base, ideally by enough to also lower tax rates. Now, you do realize what broaden the base means, yes? It means that people who are now too poor to pay federal income taxes will wind up paying them. More taxpayers, broader base. In fact, they're hoping that that will bring in enough money to lower tax rates, which means that their goal is for poor people to pay more taxes so they can pay less. And meanwhile, corporations don't pay anything at all. And if that idea doesn't strike you as outrageous, I can't imagine what would. All right, from there, we're actually hopping directly into our other weekly feature, the Clown Award. The Clown Award, given on a regular basis for meritorious stupidity. Scott Lively, that's who this is about. Scott Lively is a supposed minister out in Springfield, Massachusetts. He originally gained notoriety because he was the driving force behind a bill in the nation of Uganda to make uh, being gay punishable by death. Apparently, however, gays are not his only target for death. There are also strippers. This past Friday, November 23rd, there was a gas explosion in Springfield that leveled a strip club there and severely damaged some other buildings in the area. 18 people were injured as a result. Lively released a statement saying that for two years, his church services, quoting, have included an appeal to God to destroy the works of Satan in this city. We have specifically included the strip clubs in these prayers. He declared the blast was, quoting again, the hand of God at work in answer to our prayers. Now remember, other buildings were damaged by this, and 18 people, including nine firefighters, two cops, four gas workers, a water and sewer worker, and two other people were injured. But all of that is okay because apparently, after all, strippers. Scott Lively, one of the clowniest clowns I have ever had on this feature. All right, now for the rest of the show, I'm gonna be talking about something that's actually very, very serious. Um, and I wanted to spend a fair amount of time on it. There are, as I do this, negotiations going on in Cairo to uh, work out the specific details of the mini ceasefire that was agreed to last week that ended the latest cycle of bloodshed in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Egypt is acting as a go-between because neither Hamas nor Israel wants to talk to the other directly. During that fighting, 167 Palestinians were killed, most of them civilians. A good number of those were children. Uh, as against, on the other hand, there were six Israelis killed, four of them civilians, and three of those, three of those, the Israeli authorities said wouldn't have been killed if they paid attention to the warnings and taken shelter. This was a kill ratio, in other words, of 28 to 1. In fact, that's been the story for years, for years. In the period September 29th, uh, 2000 to September 30th, 2012, the last 12 years, 1,097 Israelis, military and civilian together, have been killed by Palestinians. 6,622 Palestinians, more than six times as many, have been killed by Israelis. More Palestinian children have been killed by the Israeli military than the total number of Israelis killed by Palestinians in that time. Now that frankly is a bit of history, that, a bit of context that I bet you're not going to hear on the evening news. Here's another one. Start with the fact that there are two major political alignments among the Palestinians. There is Fatah, which is uh, Yasser Arafat's old group, and Hamas. In 2005 and 2006, there were elections held in the West Bank and Gaza uh, for, for everything from local council up to the presidency. Israel and the U.S. have been demanding these elections as a precondition to continued negotiations because they felt that Fatah, which they thought had become sufficiently malleable, they thought Fatah would do well. But when the elections happened, 
It was a shock. Hamas did well. In fact, they won a majority of seats in the Palestinian Legislative Council. In March 2007, after months of difficult negotiations, Hamas and Fatah announced a coalition government. The U.S. and Israel flatly refused to deal with that government, even to recognize that government, and they even said this before the government was even formed. They demanded Hamas has to be kicked out. Remember, this is a government that came into being as the result of elections which the U.S. and Israel demanded. But they didn't care. Their plan didn't work, their side didn't win, so the elections didn't matter. They're down the, down the, 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 the trash hole of history. In the face of that refusal, the coalition government broke down. Civil war among the Palestinians broke out, the result of which was that Hamas got forced out of the West Bank and Fatah got forced out of Gaza. That's why Hamas is in control of Gaza. It's the result of a civil war that broke out as the result of the collapse of a government that occurred in a significant part because the U.S. and Israel would not accept the results of elections which they themselves demanded. Hamas's position in, in Gaza was confirmed just this past May when they were, uh, there was elections there. And the fact is, Hamas is the elected government of Gaza, and if the U.S. and Israel don't like it, they should remember it was their own pig-headed stubbornness that actually caused this. Except on the other hand, maybe it wasn't pig-headed, and maybe it wasn't stubborn. I'm certainly not the first person to suggest that maybe Israel doesn't want peace. Nine years ago, I said on my blog that it appeared to me that every time there was a chance for some significant step toward peace to be taken, that Israel undertook some provocative action, something sure to provoke a response, which could be used to justify a greater Israeli counter, which could then undermine the chances of progress. In that particular case, nine years ago, it was the fact that an assembly of radical Palestinian groups was considering offering Israel some form of recognition, something which Fatah had already done. All right, what was it this time? Something else, which the mainstream media won't tell you unless you happen to catch an op-ed in the New York Times. And we are going to take a break, and we are going to come back to this after. All right, and we're back. Now, that op-ed I was telling you about, it was by Gershon Baskin. He's the co-chair of the Israeli-Palestine Center for Research and Information. He's a columnist for the Jerusalem Post. And he had previously successfully opened a back-channel negotiation with Hamas that uh, resulted in the release of an Israeli soldier. Now, if you saw last week's show, you know that I blame Israel for the most recent outbreak of violence most recent outbreak, most re recent cycle of retaliation and counter-retaliation and counter-counter-retaliation and counter-counter-counter-counter-retaliation, uh, this time because Israel clearly broke a ceasefire that had been arranged. They did it by assassinating Ahmad al-Jabari, who was the uh, head of Hamas's military. They did this in a rocket attack. Now, shortly before his murder, Baskin says he, that is Baskin, and Ghazi Hamad, who was the deputy foreign minister of Hamas, had been working out a draft agreement for a long-term ceasefire. This agreement included mechanisms to verify compliance uh, and, to, and to ensure compliance. It even included a very dramatic understanding that if Israel had a genuine ticking time bomb, that is, they actually had direct evidence of people uh, just about to launch a rocket strike, that if Israel struck that particular site, it would not be considered a violation of the ceasefire. Well, the, um, as Baskin describes it, what would happen usually before this was this. I'm quoting him now, quoting the op-ed. The Israeli army takes preemptive action with an airstrike against the suspected terror cells, which are often made up of fighters from groups like Islamic Jihad, the Popular Resistance Committees, or Salafi groups not under Hamas's control, but operating within its territory. These cells launch rocket attacks into Israeli towns near Gaza, and they often miss their targets. The Israeli Air Force responds swiftly. The typical result is between 15 and, 20, uh, 15 and 25 casualties in Gaza, zero casualties in Israel, and huge amounts of property damage on both sides. 
Now, Jabari was not willing to give up resistance against Israel, but he, along with other leaders of Hamas, had come to realize the futility of rocket attacks that left no damage in Israel, but dozens of injured in Gaza. So not only was Jabari aware of these negotiations between Baskin and Hamad, he had told Hamad that he was interested in a long-term ceasefire, and in fact, he would have been the one to enforce it. On November 14th, Jabari was presented with the draft agreement. A few hours later, he was dead. The highest levels of the Israeli government, aware of these contacts, aware of these negotiations, aware of the draft, faced the dire possibility that the leader of Hamas's military might agree to a long-term ceasefire, and they preferred to kill him. As Robert Dreyfus said in The Nation recently, quoting, Israel's far right and much of the center has long acted as if moderate Palestinians were the enemy. To the extent that Israel says it can't negotiate with Palestinians, killing their moderate and pro-peace leaders makes it a self-fulfilling policy. Israel thrives on radical Palestinians. In fact, he adds, more context you won't have heard, Israel helped create Hamas in the 70s and 80s as a counterweight to Fatah in the West Bank. And when Israel pulled out of Gaza in 2006, it knew Hamas would come to power there. And that, that is really the big thing that you won't hear from the media. In fact, the, the media is basically forbidden to say this. Our political leaders are basically forbidden to say this. They are effectively forbidden to say that Israel, or at least Israeli governments dating back decades now, have not wanted peace. The government of Israel now does not want peace. For years, for decades following the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948, it was the Arab nations and then it was radical Palestinians who were the obstacles to peace. That is no longer true and it has not been true for years. Peace, now not tranquility, not, not horizon to horizon quietude, quietude but peace, recognized borders, trade, commerce, cultural exchanges, uh, reasonable security, peace, is there to be had if Israel is willing to take it. And it's not. Unhappily, Israel's people have become as hardened as its government. According to a poll of Israeli Jews published just this week, 59% of Israeli Jews want preference in public jobs for Jews over Arabs. 49% want the state to treat Jews better than Arabs. 33% object to Israeli Arabs having the right to vote, even though they are citizens living within the borders of, Israeli, uh, of Israel proper and are 20% of the population. 69% objected giving the vote to Palestinians if Israel annexes the West Bank. 74% support separate roads for Israelis and Palestinians in the West Bank. 42% object to their children going to the same school as Arabs. Imagine the reaction if some other country had a poll and they said 42% of their people objected to their children going to school with Jews. American correspondents in Israel there to cover the fighting found people offering genocidal uh, sentiments with, without even prompting. Push the elite on Gaza, said one. Make it disappear, said another. Kill them all, said yet another. In that context, the recent comments of, of Gilad Sharon, uh, the son of Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, that Israel should flatten entire neighborhoods in Gaza almost seems moderate by comparison. But all right, Gaza, Gaza, what, what of Gaza? What's it like there? You know, we've heard a lot about people, Israelis in southern Israel, living under the threat of Palestinian rockets. What of Palestinians living in Gaza under the threat of Israeli bombs? For several years now, Gaza has been a huge outdoor concentration camp. Not like a concentration camp, a concentration camp. Israel imposed a blockade on the area in 2007, essentially imprisoning the people there and has been choking it ever since. Except for one small border crossing with Egypt, which Israel keeps a close eye on, Israel controls the entire border of Gaza, including who, go, who and what goes in or out. The area is surrounded by an Israeli security perimeter, and any Palestinian approaching within a couple of hundred yards of that perimeter stands to be shot and killed. 
Israel controls the airspace above. It maintains a naval blockade. Israel is in control of Gaza's natural resources, its power supply, its telecommunications. Israel strictly controls and limits what goods can go in. Exports from Gaza are virtually banned entirely. Now, despite some recent economic growth, uh, which is fueled almost entirely by smuggling from Egypt, the UN says that the people of Gaza are worse off than they were in the 1990s. And what's more, that recent growth is unsustainable. Unemployment was at 29% in 2011 and rising, especially among women and the young. Three in four residents in Gaza rely on UN food aid to get by. The UN also reports that the coastal aquifer, the area's only natural source of fresh water, may be unusable by 2016. According to the UN, the Gaza Strip will not be a livable place by 2020 unless action is taken to improve conditions there. Gaza is a society that has been deliberately and consciously reduced to a state of abject destitution. It's one productive population transformed into one of aid-dependent paupers. And Israel's intention is to make this worse. Israeli Foreign Minister Eli Yashi said that the goal is to, quoting, send Gaza back to the Middle Ages. All this is what's known as collective punishment. And in addition to being manifestly cruel and unjust, it is also blatantly illegal under international law. Despite all that, despite all that, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu can look straight into the camera and with a straight face tell the bold-faced lie that there is no humanitarian crisis in Gaza and accuse relief workers and uh, human rights activists of trying to smear and slander is Israel's name. And what's our own government's response to this? The same as always. Fanning, groveling endorsement of every lie Israel tells and every crime it commits in support and pursuit of those lies. Consider the actions of the U.S. government as the latest round of violence in Gaza was escalating. The U.S. vetoed a U.N. Security Council resolution, a ceasefire resolution, on the ground it seems that it was too even-handed. That is, it didn't put all the blame on Hamas. The State Department publicly attacked a NATO ally, Turkey, because it criticized Israeli aggression. The Senate and the House unanimously passed resolutions offering full-throated support to whatever it was Israel was doing, uh, and increased military aid is sure to follow. Now, in fairness, I have to say that eh, this wasn't actually truly unanimous. Dennis Kucinich, the, 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 uh, the House measure was passed by voice vote. Dennis Kucinich said that had he been there, he would have objected to it, but it came up so fast, it was done so quickly that he didn't have a chance to be in the chamber. All right, but let's go past that. What of our Nobel Peace Prize winner? Obama said the U.S. is, quoting, fully supportive of Israel's right to defend itself. No country on earth would tolerate missiles raining down. Ben Rhodes, a deputy national security advisor, echoed that Isra Israelis have endured far too much of a threat from these rockets for far too long. Now, this level of hypocrisy is hard to grasp. All right, Israel has the right to defend itself? Okay. Why don't the Palestinians? Speaking of that, why don't the people of Pakistan, of Afghanistan, of Somalia, of, of Yemen, of anywhere else where U.S. rockets and drones have rained down, why don't they have the right to self-defense? Oh, no. The right of self-defense only belongs to people we support. And in that case, in this case, it's Israel. In our government and in our media, Israel, with the world's fourth largest military, is never the aggressor. It, 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 it can't be the, the aggressor. It is defined as not the aggressor, defined as the target, as the innocent victim, uh, as always responding, as always merely defending itself. And it gets even worse than this. Obama called on Egypt and Turkey to intervene on Israel's behalf. He said he told him that, uh, and I'm quoting here what he said he told him, if there's a further escalation of the situation in Gaza, then the likelihood of us getting back on any kind of peace track that leads to a two-state solution is going to be pushed off way into the future. Now, whether that was meant as advice, or I think more likely a threat, the fact is it's a hideous joke. 
A two-state solution has been talked about for decades. I first heard about it around 1970. It has supposedly been the topic of negotiations for over 20 years. And it's still no closer because Israel doesn't want it. When was a Palestinian, Palestinian state not way off in the future? Raising that now, especially at a time when more and more people, more and more analysts are saying that a two-state solution is no longer possible because of the decades of illegal Israeli land seizures and, and illegal Israeli settlements in the West Bank, it's, it's, it's not even a joke. It's asinine, except where it's not being a ventriloquist dummy for Israeli talking points. Obama also said that peace in the region must begin with no missiles fired into Israel's territory. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton said the same thing. This is right after she got Egypt to remove any mention of the siege of Gaza from the ceasefire proposal, even as something to be discussed later. Worse than that, even something else that was absent from the proposal for a ceasefire was a requirement that as part of that, Israel stop assassinating Hamas leaders. In other words, Israel's position, backed by the U.S., is that Israel can say to Hamas, we can continue to kill your leaders with impunity, and you don't dare do a thing about it, because if you do, that's breaking the ceasefire. Meanwhile, the White House said it would use the opportunity of a ceasefire to intensify efforts to help Israel address its security needs, especially the issue of smuggling of weapons and explosives into Gaza. And you will also seek additional funding for Iron Dome and other missile defense programs, apparently on top of the $100 million already requested for that purpose, which is itself is just part of the $3 billion in U.S. military aid that will go to Israel in 2013. In short, the Israeli and the U.S. position is that Israel can continue to murder Hamas leaders with impunity and continue to degrade and destroy the people of the land of Gaza while the Palestinians must stand by and do nothing. And the U.S. will make sure that Israel has the capability to do that. Now, you want solutions? I don't have them. There are no easy solutions here. But I'll tell you what should be done on a short term. A long-term ceasefire a lifting of the siege of Gaza, U.S. support for the Palestinians' bid for non-member observer status at the U.N., and explicit recognition of Israel by the Palestinians' right to statehood, and most importantly, a suspension of U.S. military aid to Israel until this happens. In the longer run, Israel has an existential question it must face. Is it to be a Jewish state or a democratic one? Recent events, including that poll that I cited, are showing it cannot long continue to claim to be both. That's it. That's all I got. So I'm going to get out of here. Uh, I wish you uh, the best week you can possibly have. We will see you next week, hopefully with some better news about something. Have a great week.